Sometimes even good people can make a mistake. And when it happens, it's one of the most intense and emotional experiences of your life. It could be a DUI, or maybe you were in the wrong place with the wrong people at the wrong time. Or perhaps you just did something stupid at the spur of the moment without even thinking, and now you're in trouble with the law. Well, you need experienced legal help right away so you don't become a victim of the criminal justice system. Even good people can make a mistake, and if you, a friend or loved one, has been accused of a crime, don't make another mistake by hiring the wrong attorney for the kind of help you need. You need to visit ToddJohnsLaw.com. That's ToddJohnsLaw.com, and then call Attorney Todd Johns today. Attorney Todd Johns has decades of experience helping good people like you who have made mistakes or bad decisions and will stand by you every step of the way. ToddJohnsLaw.com. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to That's Enough Out of You. I am your host, Bill Rader. And joining me um, is my co-host, Sean Kane. Sean, what's going on? Billy Reds, how you doing, buddy? I can't complain. Doing okay. Um, it's been an interesting, I know this, you know, this by the time this this podcast airs, I'm sure there'll be a million new uh stories but uh just been a crazy couple of weeks hasn't it yeah it has and i'll tell you what though billy i i you, i remember saying on a speakeasy not too long ago that there there was no juice left in the red sox yankee series and in, in rivalry but boy was i wrong because these yeah. last couple of games billy la i mean the last two games have just been tremendous i mean yeah it feels like old school rivalry you know it feels like you know playoff baseball i mean it was really really exciting games so uh maybe tonight yep. uh we'll get a third one buddy yeah 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 definitely and again by the time this uh this drops who knows where the where these teams will be but uh yeah it's been it's been pretty fun definitely definitely all right sean we have um a a, a topic today that has been requested quite often yes uh by our by our loyal uh listeners and you know we've done a lot of shows on the Italian mafia. Uh, we've done some Irish mafia stuff. Um, we've done you know mafia from from all over the country. But this is really the first time we're going to focus on the Jewish mafia, which is which is very instrumental in you know in in Cosa Nostra and, and starting you know the the mob in in this country and organized crime in this country. And John, I know this is a, a subject you've been working hard on um and it's again it's you know one of the most requested things that we've we've had from our listeners so where do you where do you want to start sean Who who's like top on the list that we're, where we're going to start today well before we even get into that billy i just want to tell tell our listeners you know a lot of the information um i did a deep dive on a lot of um newspaper articles and uh fbi files and um took a lot from tj english the great author um so that that's where a lot of the information came from. Um, but but before we even get into it, Billy, I just want to say when we when we're talking about, you know, Jewish gangsters, Irish gangsters, Italian gangsters, you know, you, you gotta be careful. We're talking specifically about gangsters. We're not trying to discriminate against uh immigrants that came to this country because certainly so many Jewish uh immigrants and Irish immigrants and Italian immigrants came here and and made something, made it, you know, became doctors and lawyers and built the railroads and fought in the wars. And right. and that has nothing to do with this very small percentage of gangsters. Right. You know, that, that very small percentage immigrants that became gangsters, you know, and I think it's very important to, to, to distinguish between that. And I think, you know, with, even with the, the Irish and the Jewish uh, gangsters, there's a certain uh, level of violence that they take it to. That's even more hardcore than the, the Italian American uh Cosa Nostra and I think a lot of that bill has to come from oppression you know what I mean like you you had a lot of these Jewish immigrants fleeing Germany fleeing Poland you know from the Nazis and then you had the Irish immigrants fleeing you know their homeland from the British oppression and the, the potato famine and and when you get somebody 
that could tap into that anger that comes from oppression, you could really get a gangster that that could do some really damage. And that's where I think you see a lot of this with, with the Irish and the Jewish gangsters, where they take the violence to the next level. And I think a lot of times the Jewish gangsters are stereotyped, Bill, as, you know, they were kind of the brains, they were the accountants, they were the, the, the and that's, that's true to a sense. They were the right. brains behind, you know, a lot of it, but take, do, do not take that these guys were not violent because these guys were very violent. And, and that's the disclaimer that we put on all of these episodes, Sean, is we're not celebrating these guys. These oh. were criminals. These are violent, violent criminals who cared about one thing. Right. Making money. Making money. Exactly. You know, and it was a very, it was really just a, a generation or two, you know, that that were involved in this when, when you're talking specifically about the Irish and the Jewish gangsters, you know, and the, the so it's very, just a, a very specific limited time, you know, period in, in American history, you know? So let's get into Bill and, and, you know, we'll start, we'll start with the big names. Um, we'll start with Arnold Rothstein. You know, Rothstein was, you know, everybody should know that name. Um, he was an infamous uh, gangster, um, probably around, you know, the late, like until 1918, around that time, he was probably, if not the most, uh, you know, powerful gangster in the country. He was probably the most wealthy gangster in the country. Very powerful, involved in everything. And like you said, Billy, the one thing is making money. And this guy made money every way you could possibly make it. Legitimately, right. through regular, you know, through legit businesses, uh, through every, you know, illegitimate uh, thing you could you could find. I mean, he was involved in everything. And right. the thing he's most infamous for, Bill, is the the 1919 World Series, the Black Sox scandal. Yep. And the thing is, Bill, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of so much disinformation, so much that is legend. And, you know, some people say that, you know, may, maybe it really wasn't fixed. These guys, maybe they weren't involved and, you know, maybe it never really happened that way. But but I did a lot of investigating on it. And, and the thing is, Bill, the, the one thing that's a myth is uh, that Arnold Rothstein was the mastermind of the of the Black Sox scandal. And that's not true, right. though. He was right. involved, but he was not the mastermind. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what ends up happening, they, they, well, the official story, Bill, they, that they rigged the, the World Series, you know, the, the White Sox in uh, the Cincinnati Reds. In the, the last game, the, the Reds, Reds win 10 to 5. They win the World Series. And the, you know, the accusation was that the White Sox threw the World Series. You know, and they they gambled on it and they made money on it. And they they were acquitted at trial, Billy. But yeah. there were rumors that they had confessions that they they had from the players that were involved. And all the players that were accused ended up getting a lifetime ban. Right. right. The ban from the sport. So what I did a deep dive, Billy, and I found that here's here's this official story that that I think makes sense. And I think this is from the evidence that we have that we could present the the mastermind of the black Sox scandal was a guy by the name of sports sullivan from boston right, right. have you ever joseph. heard of him? joseph sports sullivan yeah very yep. shady character um he's not your very typical you know irish gangster he's more like he was a math wizard he was like a he was a professional gambler he he got in trouble in the early 1900s he he tried to bribe a, a Red Sox pitcher. I'm sure you heard of a guy by the name of Cy Young. You yep. know, a little award named after him. And, <laughs> uh, but anyway, here's what happened, Billy. So, so Sports Sullivan gets together with uh, Chick Gandel. Chick Gandel was the first baseman in the Chicago White Sox. And they right. have this meeting in the, the the Buckminster Hotel in Boston. It's a it's still there. It's a, a famous hotel. It's right on your way to Fenway. You can see it when you're walking the if you walk the Finway, you'll you'll walk right past it. Um, and they have this meeting, and you know, Sports Sullivan comes up with this plan. We're gonna we're gonna rig the World Series. And um what happens is they bring another gambler in, um, a guy by the name of Abe Attell, and then they start to bring in more players. So they end up bringing in like eight players. And one of the legends is that Shoeless Joel Jackson was one of them. But here's the thing, Bill. I'm kind of on the fence about Shoeless Joe because he never attended any of the meetings with the other players. And right. they said he was using a front 
he was using another player as a front. Yeah. I'm thinking he might have backed out. He might have been initially interested in, and then he backed out. But I don't see a lot of evidence that that Shula's Joe, like you just can't put him at these meetings. Right. So anyway, they get together and they have, you know, they get eight players involved and they're going to, they're going to throw the world series. They're going to make a bunch of money because they're going to bet on the reds. The problem is, is that the players wanted upfront money, of course. So this is where Rothstein comes in sports. Sullivan knew Rothstein. They knew each other. They had, they, they respected each other's reputations. So sports Sullivan goes to, to Rothstein in New York. And he says, you know, he tells him his plan and he says, you front the money on the players and paid, paid them up front and we'll make a ton of money. And that's, that's what happened. And that's how Rothstein was involved in it. And the thing is, Billy, they didn't make as much as you think, you know, from what I think they, they made, you know, a few thousand here or there, which back then was a lot of money, but it wasn't right. like they didn't make millions on this, you know? And I, I think, you know, if you look at the evidence, they, they, the players, there was something there. They were, they did, you know, Rig the World Series. I think it's a myth that people say that, that there was nothing there because I think there was evidence. Sure. And, but I'm still on the fence about Shula's Joe. Uh, I'm not on the fence about Sports Sullivan. He was the mastermind. Rothstein was definitely involved. Yeah. Oh, and, and Rothstein was a powerful gangster. He he mentored Meyer Lansky, you know, who would become on. We're going to talk about him shortly. He mentored some of these other guys. He actually mentored Lucky Luciano. You know, because Luciano's coming up at this time, he's going to form the commission shortly. But but Rothstein kind of mentors him along, and then Rothstein gets in trouble, Bill, with some gamblers, and um, he didn't pay off a debt. And supposedly they ordered a hit on him, and Rothstein ends up getting getting whacked. Well, before that, Sean, he was even involved with uh, some horse racing uh, yeah. scandals where he was uh, he, he was working with. Forget if it was a was it a trainer for, for with a trainer. horse. He, the, the trainer, yeah. Bill, there was nothing Rothstein wasn't involved in. Let's yeah, I mean, it, Rothstein you know, this... made money every way you could possibly make money. Right. He, like I said, at one point he was probably the most wealthy, wealthiest gangster in the in the country. Yeah. And as far as the Black Sox scandal, Sean, I mean, we could do an entire episode on that. You cool. know, we there's so much there we could talk about, but uh, um. Yeah, and I and and then yeah, like you said, Rothstein ends up getting 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 killed, and he wasn't uh, he, he was a fairly young man, right? I mean, when when he was when he was killed. Yeah, I I forget how old he was, but yeah, he, he was in his forties. Yeah, forties maybe. He wasn't he wasn't old. No, he wasn't. Yeah. You know, but a lot of them guys, Billy. I mean, like I said before, Al Capone wasn't old. Right. You know, yeah. No man in the movies, but the, you know, he wasn't. A lot of these guys that came up, um, you know, but Rothstein is is. You know, he's one of the most important, you know, he's even mentioned, I think they mentioned Godfather too, when they're talking to the, yeah, the Hyman Roth character, he talks well, about. And, in fact, Hyman Roth was, you know, I guess supposedly based on, on Roth's thing. They just, they cut the steam. Yeah. You know what though? I, I think I see, I see where they say that, but I see a lot of Meyer Lansky in. in yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Well, he, I'm too. sure he was like a, he was probably like a, you know. Uh, sure. A, conglomeration or whatever you, whatever that word is but what do you see with Rossi, though, these guys. this this is the important thing is you see the the early collaboration between the irish gangsters the jewish gangsters and the italian because you see where you know rothstein like sports sullivan is irish he has no problem reaching out to rothstein who's jewish sports sullivan's in boston but rothstein's in new york but there's a connection there you know there's an early connection that that you know these guys are real comfortable working together. There's a certain amount of trust that you have that you don't really have with, with other ethnic groups. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a quick, uh, quick break. Okay. And then we'll come back. We'll talk about the next guy on your list. Okay. Let's do that. All right. DK's corner has moved. Come see us in our brand new location at 201 Cherry street in Jessup, Pennsylvania, right across from the Jessup Plaza. Enjoy a brand new menu with hot and cold sandwiches, soups, salads, pizza, delicious breakfast, including breakfast bowls and sandwiches, specialty coffees, and DK's famous Razzle Dazzle Flavor Shake and Espressos, and still the best cheese steaks around. Follow DK's Corner on Facebook and Instagram, or call them at 570-209-0278. 
to find out about their daily specials and catering. And DK's Corner now has beautiful outdoor seating for the summer. Don't feel like leaving the house? Call DK's Corner for delivery. And we thank DK's Corner for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. DK's Corner. That's Enough Out of You is sponsored by Carfecta, Scranton's premier destination for finding the vehicle of your dreams. With a commitment to service, value, and selection, Carfecta is your trusted partner in every step of your auto purchase journey. Our sales staff will work with you to select the perfect vehicle from our diverse inventory. Our friendly office staff will assist you in securing financing and offering warranties. At Carfecta, our dedicated team is here to make your car buying experience seamless and satisfying. Located in Scranton, Pennsylvania at 220 South 7th Avenue or call us at 272-770-0080 and check us out on Facebook. With years of experience serving the area, our dealership is dedicated to offering high-quality pre-owned vehicles to our customers. From the moment you walk through our door, we're committed to providing you with a great car buying experience. With our skilled sales staff and financing options, we'll help you get the vehicle you want at the great price you deserve. Visit Carfecta today and let us exceed your expectations. Are you thinking about selling your house? Well, Bob Connors, a realtor at Christian Saunders Real Estate says, I can't sell your house, but I sure as heck can market it and get it from sell to sold. Call Bob today for great marketing and to get a ton of eyeballs on your house. Are you in the market to buy a home? Not sure where to start. If it looks like something you shouldn't buy, Bob's gonna tell you that. Think you can't buy a house or have no idea where to start? Been there, done that. Bob will get you going in the right direction. You can reach Bob at 570-614-3624 or 570-335-9000. And you can find Bob on Facebook at Bob Connors Realtor. Whether you call Bob or not, please remember, stay awesome all you awesome humans and be kind to each other. Bob Connors, the realest real estater. And thanks to Bob Connors and Christian Saunders Real Estate for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. All right, Sean, we are back with our um, our topic, Jewish gangsters. So who's uh, we talked about Arnold Rothstein in the first segment. Who, who are we talking about now? Well, it's got to be Meyer Lansky, Bill. I mean, yeah. probably yeah. the most, you know, Rothstein is in Meyer Lansky is probably the most infamous uh, Jewish gangster. You know, he, he may have become the most powerful. I, I think, it, you know, at one point he probably passes off Rothstein. Because just the power this man had. And the thing is, Billy, it's funny. When he died, the family said that, that he only had $57,000. And his, his, that, that was what was left of his fortune, which is it's a joke, Billy. Because Meyer right. invented, he kind of invented, I, I don't want to say invented, but he's the guy that really used, one of the first people to use like Swiss bank accounts and hiding your money and hiding money in different names. And he had money in his, his brother's name and relatives' names and and Meyer was just, you know, he's portrayed as, you know, again, like an accountant. You see a lot of times you see him in the, the movies, he'd be a guy with glasses and he looks like an accountant or a lawyer or something. But and Meyer was very smart, but Meyer was a street guy. He came up as a, a street guy and, and came up with, with guys like Oni Madden, who's Irish, and Lucky Luciano. And, and he was a tough guy when he was young. He was, he was a small guy. He wasn't big. But he was definitely a guy that would use his fists when he was younger, coming up, and and he was, you know, he was. But he was a very smart guy, and he became a very powerful. He became almost like Luciano's consigliere, in a lot of ways. But he also had so many ties, Billy, to like Permindex, which Clay Shaw was involved in, and in in um, Israel Israeli Mossad, he had ties to. He, you know, he was very active with with, with Israel. You know, he tried to go over there kind of similar to the, to the Hyman Roth. You know, I'm a retired businessman or what do right. you say? Investor, retired investor living on a pension. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. In um, Lansky and the thing, the importance of Lansky, though, Billy, is his involvement in something called Project Underworld. Now, Project Underworld was when the U.S. government, specifically the U.S. Navy through Navy intelligence, was worried about during World War II, they're worried about the sabotage on the docks from the Nazis and the Nazi sympathizers. So they wanted to reach out to the underworld because they knew the underworld controlled the docks. And the problem is there was there was kind of a, 
uh, uneasy relationship. You had the New York Docs were controlled by a couple of guys. One guy was a guy by the name of Joe Sox Lanza, who ran the the uh, Fulton Fish Market in Manhattan. Bill, he was you heard about the Fulton Fish Market. The mafia ran that for years. Sure, but Sox was one of Lucky Luciano's key guys. He was a key guy in the Genovese family, and another guy was um, Joe the Boss Ryan, who was the Irish gangster. who was head of the, the union, uh, ran the docks there, and he had two guys, uh, Cockey Dunn and, and Squint Sheridan. I believe both of them ended up in the electric chair. Uh, they were they were vicious hitmen that that worked for him, and you know he controlled another section. And then of course you had Albert Anastasia, who was, I'm sure everybody knows and. Saw that famous picture. He would later get whacked in the barber chair. Right. Yep. John Gotti's hero. And, you know, but those three guys really ran the docks. So the government wanted, you know, how could we get these guys to work together and understand that we need them and they they could use us. And, and the one person that could do that was Lucky Luciano because he he was, at this point, he creates the commission. You know, he's he's you got the the five families running things. But the problem was Luciano was in prison, so they couldn't go to Luciano. So who do they go to? The next best guy, right? And that was Meyer Lansky. So Meyer Lansky, go, the government goes to him, the Navy intelligence goes to him, and Lansky reaches out to the three guys and says, look, at this is what needs to be done. And the reason the government could trust Lansky is because, you know, they they knew because he was Jewish that he had a reason to fight the Nazis. And he was he was very big. And a lot of these Jewish gangsters, Bill, were very active in, in fighting. They knew what was going on there in Europe with, with Nazi Germany, and they were very right. active in fighting with them. So the government felt that they, you know, they knew these guys were gangsters, but they also knew that there was a sense of, hey, these guys, you know, want to fight the Nazis just as much as we do. A common enemy, right. A common enemy, yes. Yep. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And right. that's basically what they did. And this would later set the stage, Bill, for, what would happen down the line with Whitey Bulger working for the government? What would the, the they would reach out the CIA would reach to have Bob Mayhew go and and reach out to Johnny Roselli and Sam Giancana and Santo Traficante to try to kill Fidel Castro? So that all sets the stage bill with Project Underworld, and that's where that comes in. You know, and Lansky was the key to that. Meyer Lansky was the key. And another thing is the uh, the government. You know, James Angleton would would um, have the uh, pictures of Jagger Hoover um, in, you know, very, uh, you know, the, like, let's let's call it what it is, you know, homosexual situations with with Clyde Colson. And he gave those pictures to to uh, James, Ang James Angleton, gave them to Meyer Lansky. So the, the mob would, would blackmail Hoover and Hoover would say that the mob never existed, you know. So Lansky was a very important figure. Um, you know, they, they try to say that because he, he only claiming that he had $57,000 to his name when he died, that maybe he wasn't as powerful as people said, but that's, that's hogwash, Billy. Lansky was an extremely powerful gangster. And you, again, you see where, how he could work. He could work with Joe Ryan, who's Irish. He could work with, with Sox there, who's Italian and Albert Anastasia. And he could, he could be the one guy who could speak for Luciano when Luciano's in prison. And there was a lot of involvement too, Sean, with Cuba, right? They they Cuba, had yeah, they had casinos. Lansky had big uh, big investments in Cuba, like a lot of these guys did. Yeah, and Lansky was huge into that, you know. So that that's another situation. Like when they talk later down the road about the the plots to kill Fidel Castro, a lot of people put Lansky in there. The problem is, Billy, I seen most of the files that were declassified, and it's the same thing with Carlos Marcello. Their name's not there, so you can't. It's speculation. When right. Say, but I mean, it would make sense that Lansky Lansky would have a big reason to get rid of Fidel Castro. There's no yeah. doubt. About that. And then and wasn't there, you know, kind of like the Godfather, wasn't there? There was a big meeting of, of these mafia figures in Cuba, the, yeah. the hotel uh, not, Nacional. A lot of them. And, and there was guys like we're going to talk about uh, another gangster, uh, Mo Dalitz. He was a Jewish gangster, very powerful. He was involved in the casinos. And a lot of these guys, Traficante, they had, uh, you know, major investments in Cuba because right. he was, you know, he's the boss of Miami, basically down in Florida, Tampa area. So he had he had big investments. So a lot of these guys, yeah. And there was a big meeting, kind of similar to like the Godfather too. Right. 
you know, but the, the thing in the Godfather, like Lansky never turned on, you know, like, like Hyman Roth turns on because Lansky understood, you know, that there's, there's so much money to be made here. There's more money working together. Now there is going to be, we're going to talk about when we get into Bugsy Siegel, we're going to talk about some issues that, that happened with Bugsy and he had to go, you know, so talk about that. But for the most part, Lansky understood, you know, it's easier to work with, with people and let's try to avoid these wars because nobody makes money if they're killing each other. Right. Absolutely. So you want to take another break here? Or do you want to move on to the next one? Um, yeah, you know what? Let's uh, we'll do a quick, uh, quick break and then we'll move on. And we would like to thank our sponsor, gracious day grains. Uh, Sean, you like to eat healthy, don't you? Always buddy. I try to eat healthy as much as I can. Yeah, and there is nothing healthier than uh, what they call like farm to table, right? This so when you when you can get something right from the ground and and make it and then put it right on your table. Um, and Gracious Day Grains, they have a tremendous selection, it, and it's totally organic. Everything is, you know, they don't use any sort of herbicides or pesticides or anything like that. They have. Um, a bunch of different uh, different products on their website, Gracious Day Grain. So if you go to graciousdaymilling.com, uh, you, you'll find a, a bunch of great stuff there, Sean. Yeah, you will, Billy. And, and it's owned by Tom Maxey, who's a, who's a great guy from Virginia. Um, he's a truth seeker, just like uh, me and you, buddy. And uh, Tom's growing philosophy follows the wisdom of farmers of centuries past. And a quote from Tom is, if we practice the right rotations, we exclude the bugs and weeds without needing herbicides or pesticides. So, I mean, this is great, Billy. I mean, what he's doing is fantastic. There's cornbread mix. There's cornmeal, popcorn. He sells buckwheat pan. Sean, have you had buckwheat pancakes? Have no, buddy. Oh my, they're delicious. I love buckwheat pancakes. And they, and and gracious uh, gracious day grain sells buckwheat pancakes. Just go to their website and and you know you'll be able to find all of this stuff there. You can order it right off the website. You can find out all about how they how they farm and, and their whole philosophy. Tom's philosophy is great stuff. It really is, Billy. And one of the things he does is he grinds small batches at, at very low temperatures, which retains the flavor and the freshness. Of course, and and it, I mean, you can't get any fresher than that. I mean, it's right, literally right from the ground. So again, go to graciousdaymilling.com and just you know take a look on there. You can order whatever you want, and and they'll they'll send it right to your door. Can, I mean, again, it just it doesn't get any doesn't get any fresher than that, right? From Tom's farm to your door to your table. So absolutely, and eat healthy, eat healthy, and you'll feel better. Absolutely, I wish I could do that. I wish I could eat healthier, Sean. I'm, well, start with Tom's stuff, buddy. I, I'm going to. I'm going to order some of those buckwheat pancakes. I love. There making, you go. I'm going to try them too, Billy. Yeah, they're really good. All right, Gracious Day. We thank Gracious Day Grains for their sponsorship. Thank you. That's enough out of you. Is also sponsored by Case Quattro Winery, featuring over 20 flavors of wine, from dry red, dry white, and fruit for your sampling pleasure. Case Quattro Winery offers entertainment, parties, and private events. Now serving a full menu with a little something for everyone, including appetizers, salads, dinners, pizza, and desserts. Case Quattro has some of the best live entertainment in the area, with comedy and karaoke nights and live bands. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram for all of our upcoming events. And if you mention the code OUTA, that's O-U-T-T-A, you get 15% off of your order. Located on Main Street in Peckville, Pennsylvania, call 570-382-3855 for more information. And we thank Case Quattro Winery for their support. All right, Sean, so so far uh, we've talked about Meyer Lansky. uh, We've talked about Arnold Rothstein. Um, Now we got uh, a few more to go, so hit us with the next one. Well, the next big one we're going to talk about is Mickey Cohen, Billy. And I always call like Mickey Cohen is like the West coast Jewish version of Whitey Bulger. Like he was, he was trained and mentored by a lot of gangsters. Only Madden, who we talked about, who was one of the early Irish gangsters. And, and um, of course, um, uh, 
Meyer Lansky and he worked he worked with Bugsy Siegel and he he worked with Mo Dallitz who we we talked to talked about he mentored him so Mickey right. Cole goes out to the West Coast Bill and becomes a powerhouse powerhouse and in the West Coast the, the Los Angeles Mafia had the Cosa Nostra family there but they called it the Mickey Mouse Mafia the other families would laugh about it you know because they they weren't as powerful as as most of the other families they they took a back seat to a lot of them. They're run by a guy by the name of Jack Dragna, and um, he ends up in a suspicious death. Who knows what happened? But he gets in a war kind of with Mickey Cohen, and it's kind of similar. You see that, Billy, when you see, like, Whitey Bulger gets into what Angelo in Boston, and Patriarcha kind of stays out of it. And you see that, like, with Jimmy Jimmy Burke in New York gets into it with uh, Billy Bats, you know, and they, the, the, right. the mafia families kind of stay out of it because yeah. – or you're making money with these guys, you know, it's, it's, you know, and, and Cohen was that way. Like a lot of the, they stayed out of the Dragno the war and it was a war, Billy. There was a lot of killing back and forth, but, but Cohen was vicious, Billy. He was one of those guys that, that loved torture. And there was a lot of different, like he, he would put people on meat hooks and just a vicious, vicious gangster. And in the one movie um, gangster squad with Sean Penn, uh, where he plays Mickey Cohen, and it was very vicious, Billy. Very vicious. Uh, a lot of vicious scenes in there. Uh, but but Cohen was he was a tough guy, Bill. He was a boxer when he was younger. Came up on the streets, and um, he ends up convicted of tax evasion. But he became like a celebrity gangster out there in, in Hollywood, Billy. You know, and in movies like you know L.A. Confidential mentions him, right? Also. But but uh, he's a big name. Like the West Coast, when you talk about history, West Coast organized crime and stuff, he's one of the biggest names. And, and you don't hear as much about him here in the East Coast, but, you know, he was a huge, huge name. And he, he would end up dying of stomach cancer, uh, but but powerful, powerful gangster, Billy. And yeah. the, one, the next one I want to talk about, Bugsy Siegel. Um, Bugsy Siegel came up um, with Lansky and those guys. And when they start with the casinos, um, especially the the Flamingo Hotel out there in in Vegas, um, the, a lot of the mob, mob guys and the the Jewish gangsters they they would invest in that and they would have Siegel um, running it out there. And Siegel gets involved with this girl Virginia Hill, and she has him kind of skimming, and he gets a lot of trouble. And they they start really you know once he starts skimming, Billy, and it gets back word gets back east that he was taking money. You know, the word is out that, you know, Siegel's got to go. So, you know, the, the commission assigns this basically to Meyer Lansky because Siegel's Jewish. So they don't, you know, it's kind of like when they 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 were going after Mickey Spillane in New York. Who do they send? They send Mad Dog Sullivan. So they send another Irishman after an Irishman. Well, they send a Jewish gangster after a Jewish gangster, you know. And and even though he was friends with, with Siegel and very close, it was business to him. And, you know, Siegel ends up in the, the famous scene, Bill, he's in his hotel and he gets shot and they shoot him right through the eye and he's sitting there. Right. And, and, you know, Mickey Cohen was so upset about that. And yeah. and he would go, the, there was a rumor that the the guys, the, the hitmen in that were in a hotel and Mickey Cohen got some of his guys and they shot the hotel up and they, they called these guys to come down to the lobby, but they, they were probably already gone. But Cohen was really upset about what happened with Bugsy Siegel, but... Siegel was another powerful gangster, Billy. And, um, you know, what happened with him is he was skimming. And it got back, and and it's one best friend killing another, Billy, because Lansky and him yep. were real close, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then I just want to go through, there's so many different powerful Jewish gangsters, Bill, that we just don't have time because we're kind of short on time here. So I just want to go through some more and just drop some names and just, you know, a little, little bit about them. So we'll just go through these real fast. Um, one of them is George Kaufman, Billy. Do you ever hear of George Kaufman? No, he, never heard of him. Not a guy that you hear a lot about. Um, he was up in Winter Hill with with the, the Irish mob with Whitey Bulger. And what he did is he owned, he goes way back to when Howie Winter was in charge of Winter Hill before Whitey Bulger. But he ran the 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 garage up there, the Lancaster Street garage that Bulger used his, you know, ran his empire basically. One of the places he ran him out of. And, um, you know, Coffin wasn't a mechanic, Billy. He didn't know nothing about fixing cars. I mean, that was, right. you know, yeah. an interesting quick story, Billy, I got on that. Um, so I heard this from a, a friend of mine in Boston who's, whose uncle was uh, uh, one of the 
state police investigators. They were investigating the Winter Hill gang. And they had, they had, um, they were watching Kaufman and they were watching him, you know, meet with Whitey Bulger. So they, they bugged the garage. They bugged that Lancaster street garage and they were set up across the street in one of the buildings and they were listening in. And um, what happened was John Conley, who was Whitey Bulger's handler, tipped Bulger and Kaufman that they were listening in on him. So uh, state police are listening in and Bulger has his big meeting and Kaufman's there. And all of a sudden, Bulger says, I, I just want to tell everybody that, you know, the Massachusetts State Police are doing a great job. And and these guys are just they're underpaid and they're underappreciated. And and we want everybody to know that we know they're out there and and they're doing a heck of a job. And the state police are listening to this and they're like, man, you know, somebody tipped them. They know. Yeah. That. <laughs> was a very powerful guy, Bill. He ran a lot of the bookmaking up there for Bulger. Uh, so he's an important guy. Um, Shonda Burns. Uh, we're not going to go too much into him because we talked about a whole episode with him. People want to go back to the Cleveland uh, right. bomb, the bombing wars, Billy. Yeah. Danny Green, uh, the Irish mob, and they got into it with uh, the, the Cleveland Coles and Oster family. But Shonda Burns was key into that. Of course, yeah. there's Rudy Stein, Billy, in New York, the biggest loan shark. And he got killed by the Westies and they, they cut his head off and uh, chopped him up and threw him in the East River. And that set up the meeting for the Westies and the Gambino family right? And where Castellano offers them a deal to, you know, basically come in to work with the Gambinos, you know, but right, that yeah. was up because they killed him and they took his black book. They borrowed all his money yeah. and then killed him and they took his black book with all the people that owed him money. Uh, and and so, going back to Burns for just one second, Sean, if you, sure. yeah, if you, if you want to go back um, and one of our back episodes, if you haven't heard it, uh, it's called Cleveland Rocks, uh, literally. And that that's, you know, that's a really good, I think that's one of our better episodes, Sean, that, that we've done, um, you know, on the the um, the car bombings in Cleveland. So definitely, uh, you know, look for that and give that one a listen when you get a chance. Yeah, that was a good, that was a good episode. Yeah. And then another name, Billy, a huge name, uh, Lepke Buckholter. Um, he was one of the, the main guys in Murder Incorporated. Murder Incorporated was... I, group of they weren't just italian gangsters but there was a lot of jewish gangsters in there but they they killed thousands who knows how many hundreds maybe thousands of people they 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 would yeah. be like the enforcement for uh the syndicate across the country and and buck holter was vicious billy and in uh he was also powerful he was involved in unions uh another huge name bill is dutch schultz um, his real name was Arthur Flegenheimer, but he became infamous with du under Dutch Schultz. Um, powerful during during Prohibition, he was a big time bootlegger. You know, he he kind of got in a little tiff there with Capone, and he kind of got involved in the Moran Capone war that we we talked about recently. He was kind of fighting with the both of them, which isn't kind of smart. But uh, right, Dutch man was vicious. He ended up causing so much trouble that the commission ordered him you know, that they had to whack him and uh, commission ordered that hit and, and he ended up getting killed. Uh, Gus Alex is another one. Gus Alex was, uh, he became like a consigliere in, in the Chicago outfit. He was one of those guys that, you know, can't kind of came out of the Capone Moran wars in Chicago and, and Tony Accardo brings him in and he became a key, a very important um, asset to Accardo. But he, he was another guy who stayed hidden belly. You know, he he learned right. from Capone and Moran and he stayed hidden. And then Mo Dallas, who we talked about, uh, very powerful in Cuba. He was in Cleveland for a while. Uh, of course, he he goes to Vegas in the 40s and the 50s. And, um, you know, one thing I should say, Billy, when we talked about Bugsy Siegel and when when he's over there running the casinos in Vegas and stuff, after that is when New York kind of loses their grip on, on Vegas and Chicago goes into that fold. Mm -hmm. Chicago would run Vegas and they would be the key power player. And that's where Chicago would kind of run parallel to the commission, especially in the seventies with a Cardo. And uh, that was a guy, uh, Frank lefty Rosenthal, another Jewish gangster that ran the casinos there. And of course he would be infamous in the movie casino played by casino, Robert. Right. He was right, Niro, yeah. Yep. So you, again, Billy, you see the key, you see this, these key Jewish gangsters, how key they are to the entire syndicate. So when I say that you can't tell the story of American Cosa Nostra 
without talking about the Jewish gangsters or the Irish gang, you really can't, Billy. Yeah. He's so, so key. Another yeah. one, Jake Gusick, a uh, very key guy in the Capone organization and would later be brought into the fold in the outfit. Um, Harry Strauss was another one. He was a member of Murder Incorporated. Uh, Harry Keywell was a, mur- a member of the Purple Purple Gang in Detroit. We talked about them. Actually, they were mentioned in the in the book Double Cross, where the Double Cross makes the accusation that they threatened Joe Kennedy and they got in the beef with Joe Kennedy. There's no evidence of that. That's just Double Cross nonsense. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one was a guy by the name of Max Greenberg. Uh, he was a member of Egan Rats in the St. Louis area, Bill. And Egan Rats was a Irish gang. But he was a very high-ranking member of that. Um, and then really the last one, Bill, is uh, Abner Zwellman from New Jersey. Now, you probably never heard that name, but you watched the TV show that he was immortalized in, and that was Sopranos because oh, yeah. Hesh. Abner Zwellman was Hesh. He was yeah. basically Hesh, yeah. There was a lot of him in that character, and I guarantee that's where you know they got a lot of that character from. Yeah. Now, was he involved in, in the music industry like Hesh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I mean, there's so many similarities between him and Hesh. And of course, he was uh, very close to the boss in Jersey. So it was a very similar relationship with Tony and Hesh. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. A lot of, but he was a powerful guy, Billy. Very powerful guy. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more active than Hesh, you know, like very active. But, but you could definitely see the character there that, that, you know, so what you see, Billy, is you see a lot of these guys. I mean, you see how powerful these guys are. And the names, I mean, what do we name? About 20 guys here? 15, 20 guys? A lot more than than most people realize, yeah. Yeah. And they're they're key people. Like when you talk about Rothstein and and Meyer Lansky and Mickey Cohen and Bugsy Siegel, I mean Dutch Schultz, these guys were not small time gangsters. These guys were right. running operations, you know, talk about murder incorporated, you talk about you know, run because even when New York, Bill, when Cosa Nostra, when the commission is running Vegas, who's really running it for them? It's the Jewish mob that's running it, you know, because it's Lansky, right. it's it's Bugsy Siegel. You know, those are the guys, Mo Dallas, those are the guys that are running Vegas. Yeah. You know, so, and then when you talk about, you know, the Black Sox scandal and you talk about, you know, Project Underworld, and you talk about these key events in in American history and in, in you know, you can't, it's very important when you talk about the underworld, you got to talk about the Jewish gangsters, Billy, because they, they were a powerhouse. They were yeah. a powerhouse. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of names that I'm sure will be new to, to a lot of people. I'm sure, but a lot of people, I'm sure they heard, heard names. I'm sure they even heard like Lepke Buckholter. I mean, I'm sure people heard that name. If you ever right. watch the documentary on the mob, they mentioned that, you know, they mentioned him, but right. you know, and and people like Rothstein and Lansky. Sure, so, sure. Just key personnel. And, and again, Bill, when organized crime was set up, it was something called the Combine at first. And and that was basically, you know, Luciano, Lansky, and, and Oni Madden. So right there you have an Italian, a Jewish, and an Irish gangster. Yeah. Set up. And, you know, that would be the, the, really the framework for what would later become Cosa Nostra and it would be designed as the... 26 Coles and Oster families, but you always see the key uh, Jewish gangster, Irish gangster working either totally in the network, you know, like, like, you know, like Jimmy Burke in New York or whatever, or totally outside the network, like Mickey Cohen, who really had his own gang. Yeah. But, but he worked very closely with uh, the families across the country. And he's actually mentioned in, uh, the movie on the Godfather, Billy. What was the series? Uh, the offer. Oh, the offer. The offer. Yeah. I remember, because although you said he couldn't have been, he couldn't have done no, that because he, he was, was in prison. prison at that time. He yeah. was in prison, but they did put him in there where he actually shoots out the back of the car. Remember? Right. And yeah. That was goes to him, but he was right. in prison then, so it couldn't have been Mickey Cohen. Right. But again, it shows you that they wanted to get Mickey Cohen's name in there because he's a huge name, Billy. The way everybody in the West Coast knows who Mickey Cohen is. Yeah. Yeah. He was like a Hollywood gangster. He was like the Al Capone of, of, you know, Los Angeles back then. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. And if you haven't seen the offer, um, 
you know, that's a Paramount Plus series. Great series to watch. That's on the making of The Godfather and how interesting that was. And, of course, we did an episode covering that with with Alex Robinson. Uh, so, yeah, go back and listen to that um, also. But, uh, yeah, Sean, what else uh, What else do we want to cover today? Well, Anything? And, and one thing, Gangster Squad, Billy, you know, the movie with Sean Penn, um, that's a pretty decent movie. Um, but there's a scene in there, Billy, that's so vicious uh, where Mickey Cohen – Gets a guy that was was gonna rat him out to the to the government and and they they tied this this guy this poor guy Billy they tied him his his arms to one car and then his legs to another car and then they had the two cars just hit the gas pedal and just rip the mm. guy in. now mm. I couldn't find that that ever happened with Mickey Cohen but it, yeah. the thing is like the viciousness like they they there was evidence that you know he used to hang people at meat hooks and and different torture. You know, he was big into torture. Like, he was just a vicious, vicious gangster. Mm. You know, so, again, you know, just a very important figure, though, when you're talking about organized crime. And you're talking about right. the whole... Now, today, Bill, you really don't see the, the remnants of the, the Jewish gangs and the Irish gangs. They're they're pretty much... We could pretty much say they're gone. Right. Coles and Oster, Billy, I mean, I know they're still there, probably maybe seven, eight, maybe nine at the most of the families, the 26 families are probably still active, but they're not even, they're not nowhere near where they were. And even, you know, there hasn't been a New York mob hit in a long time, Billy. Right. Cause they, they're, they're frowned upon that now, you know, yeah. they don't bring any attention. And, and once they, they kind of get away from that, that fear they put in people by, by using the tool of murder, they kind of lose a lot of their power and they lost the power to unions. They lost the power of Vegas. Vegas is all corporations now. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and just, you know, it's everything is kind of, everybody's kind of assimilated in Billy. It's just not the same. It's not the same time period. Technology is really hurt organized crime. It's gotten in different ways. There's a lot of white collar crime today. Yeah. So reminds people, me, reminds me of that scene from, from the Sopranos where they're, they go into the Starbucks and they're trying to shake down the manager for, for protection money. And he said, listen, he said, every penny in this place is, is accounted for by corporate. He said, if, if, you know, if I give you something, they're going to fire me. And the next guy that comes in, isn't going to give me anything. And, yeah. and then the two guys walk out of there and they go, well, it's over for the little guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth, Billy. Yeah, like technology yeah. really, you know, those old school rackets that they had, you, you can't use those things today. You know, you just can't, can't be involved in that stuff. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and I probably, there's probably a few names, Billy, that I forgot about that I probably should have mentioned um, because there's just so many huge, you know, Jewish gangster names. But again, Billy, you see, it was a very specific time period, Billy. You know, you see like, you see prohibition, you see them really, the Jewish gangster really comes into a lot of power then. And then you see later on, you know, during World War II, again, you see the, the power. But then after that, Billy, even when you start getting into the 60s and 70s, you start to see, you know, the Jewish immigrants assimilated into American society. And, and you don't see as many Jewish gangsters. And you see the same thing with the Irish gangsters. You know, you start to see, you know, the last of the Westies the, it'd be going into the 80s and then a little bit into the 90s. And then after that, it's, you know, it's kind of done. Right. Yeah. You know? Yep. 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 So you got to take that into account, Billy. We're not trying to discriminate any ethnic groups, or we're just talking about <laughs> a specific time period, Billy, and we're not stereotyping anybody. But this is an important topic when you talk about the history of organized crime, which we try to do on a show and give an accurate detail. And again, a lot of this, you know, the TJ English did a lot of good work on this. Um, there's a couple other good authors. There's an author from Israel, Bill, and I I can't think of his name. I I should have wrote it down. I forget, but he's he's got a website. He did a lot of good work. Um, I I think he wrote I and mean, he might have wrote for the New York Times for a while, but then he then he moved to Israel. He's over in Israel now, but he's on a couple of podcasts. He does a good job. Uh, really, you know the history of it. Uh, and he brings on guys. You know, he talked to a lot of these guys. Like this guy actually interviewed Meyer Lansky before he died and he talked wow. yeah. yeah so yeah it's the rest Crazy. of the time buddy yeah definitely all right all right sean um great episode a lot of a lot of good information 
Um, as we say goodbye this week, you know, we want to make sure that you guys, if you're watching on YouTube, even if you don't watch us on YouTube, go out and find us on YouTube and please hit the subscribe. Yes. Um, doesn't cost the, anything, but it helps us. We're very close, Billy, to the next level we need to get to in subscriptions. Yeah. All you got to do is just hit that button. You'd be doing us a huge favor. And, and Bill, let's just tell the people, you know, we got a lot going on on Patreon. So, yeah. Dollar. I mean, where could you get the stuff we're, we're giving away? You know, a lot of information on, on there. We have different, we got articles on there that we don't put on a website. We got pictures that we put on there uh, for members and uh, members only. And then we got the Speakeasy episodes. Um, and then we got guests coming on Speakeasy now. It's only right. going to be there. And then, and depending on when this releases, I'm not sure if it's going to be before or after, but we've got our exclusive David uh, Whalen Q and a episode coming up on Patreon. So that's only going to be on Patreon guys. So if you are interested in watching that, uh, make sure you, you go to our Patreon. That's enough out of you. Um, you know, just look for us on Patreon and sign up. Uh, like Sean said, you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month and it gets you access to all this exclusive content. We do a weekly show, just the two of us, usually just the two of us. We have guests uh, occasionally, but uh, usually just the two of us called speakeasy. And um, it's it's just more content for you. So um, yeah, if you're interested in, in doing that, I, I definitely recommend going out there. And again, just give us a give us a, a, a click on the subscribe on YouTube and and uh, you know rate and review us on your podcast uh, app if, if you listen to us there. But uh, we, we appreciate the support. Our, check out our merch, merchandise store and our bookshop. Yep. You know, a lot of the a lot of the authors we have on, we have the books on there. Uh, so check them out. The merchandise we got, we got shirts and uh, pint glasses and mugs and hoodies and hats. And uh, it really helps us out. It builds a podcast. We were closing in on season two finale, Billy. Yeah. And then we'll be working on season three, Billy. We got some season big three. Stuff. I know season three coming up. It's going to be interesting. Going to be fun. Some new stuff coming up. So, yeah. All right. All right, Sean. Great episode. Right, and that's enough out of you. Good night, everybody. That's enough out of you podcast is executive produced and written by Bill Rader and Sean Kane and edited by Bill Rader. The That's Enough Out of You podcast and logo are exclusive property of Bags of Chicken LLC. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or accounts of this podcast without the express written consent of Bags of Chicken LLC is prohibited. So don't even try it.